Welcome to today's presentation of our project uh, Women in Agriculture and Rural Livelihoods uh, in Ethiopia. Um, the, pro the project is headed by Professor Dr. Günther Schley. Um, he has a research team of nine uh, Ethiopian researchers that are currently working in the fields and uh, two of them are with, uh, with us today as well. One of them is uh, Dr. Tirsit Saleh Dengil. She will be presenting um, and we will also watch a short movie that was uh, done by Emebet Demenash. Um, she will be also commenting on that, uh, that movie. I think this movie will show you um, a good example of uh, the method of our research because uh, other than many other development projects, we are not parachuting in consultants that stay there only for a week or so, but uh, the researchers really live uh, in the villages um, live with the women, live with the full uh, community um, and uh, therefore um, we get a totally different understanding of, uh, of the subject. Um, and the presentation will be concluded by um, uh, Dr. Mulume Bitsenebe, who is an associate professor at, at the Center for Gender Studies at the University of Addis Ababa, who will also guide us through the existing uh, literature um, that is in some ways unsatisfactory, um, and uh, our research hopes to fill the gap in this regard. Enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Britta, for this kind introduction, and good morning to everyone. The research project Women in Agriculture and Rural Livelihoods promoting gender equity within and by agricultural programs has a planned duration of 18 months with a possible extension. Of these 18 months, only three have elapsed, so we are still in an initial phase. It is financed by GIZ and administered by Austria, the Organization for Social Science Research in Eastern and Southern Africa. It has four regional components with two or three researchers in each of them. My job is to circulate between these regions, to offer methodological advice, to look for points of comparison, and to link the empirical findings to bodies of theory. Here we have the map with the four regions from north to south. These are West Gotjam in the Amhara regional state, Jima zone in Oromia, Sidama region, and the southernmost is Gamo in the Southern Nations, Nationalities and Peoples Regional State. And now let me now introduce the teams of researchers working in the respective re region. region. We here have West Gotjam, our West Gotjam team with Tirste Sale Dengle, whom you will hear later today during this presentation, and her colleague Johannes Jitbarek. Our Jimma team comprises Lydia Asegit and Zera Allo, Here's the Sidama team with Betel Begashau and Sileshi Mengistu. And the Gamma, Gambo team has three members. One of them is Emebet Demelash, who, whom you see here filming, and who will present a short version of one of her films later during this presentation. And Wengelawit Aika. And on the next slide, you have the third person of our Gambo team, Desilech Daniel. These are the researchers to whom credit is due for the examples I used during the following text, so the data are not mine. For most of my career, until my retirement, I have been a director at the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology at Halle, Saale, in Germany, where I led the department Integration and Conflict. Collective identifications and changing alliances were one of our major topics. Having worked on other kinds of collective identity, other, other kinds than gender, like nations, ethnic groups, age categories, religious affiliations, co corporate actors, political parties, name it. All these are collective identity, working on uh, having worked on other such collective identities. Already in the planning phase of the present project, I noticed that gender is a very special kind of collective identity. Especially the discourse on women differs a great deal from the discourse on other collective identities. In every analysis of a conflict, I invariably first describe the actors, individuals and groups, with their histories, their aims and their strategies, and then proceeded with the manifold interactions and changing alliances between them. It was like introducing the characters of a drama, the dramatis personae, before proceeding with the theatre play. 
Seen against this background of maybe somewhat male-focused conflict studies and political anthropology, it is surprising to see how often in the world of policy makers and development agents it is simply assumed what is good for women without asking them first. How has this come about? States have made commitments to report uh, to uh, supernatural agencies like the African Union or the United Nations Development Programme about the progress they have made towards reaching development goals. goals. Gender equity is one of these development goals and to measure progress towards it one needs indicators. This form of communication, high-level political aggregation like states being responsible to yet higher ones, directs the gaze of administrators and development agents upwards and outwards and certainly diverts it from the rural women and the highly localized life world. In the research proposal, Women in Agriculture and Rural Livelihoods, which is the st starting point of this project, uh, we state in the first paragraph, I quote, indicators about progress related to gender equality in Ethiopia and other countries often do not tell much about rural women as they are taken from an urban setting. In order to formulate better indicators that really help to improve the situation of women in agriculture, one need, more needs to be known about their life situation and aspirations. So success would need to be measured against the ambitions of both genders in life, but what women expect from their lives has often not been put on the record." End of quote. As an example of an indicator which does not fully reflect the realities of women in rural and deep rural settings, one may look at the GII, the Gender Inequality Index of the UNDP, aside from the definition by the UNDP. GII is a comp composite metric of gender inequality using three dimensions, reproductive health, empowerment and the labour market. A low GI, GII value indicates low inequality between women and men, and vice versa, end of quote. A key measurement of reproductive health, the first dimension of this the definition, is maternal mortality, which mainly depends on a modern hospital being in reach or not, and does not address differences between rural settings in which such hospitals are equally unavailable. Empowerment, to come to the second element of the definition, might be measured in terms of proportion of women in Parliament. And Parliament is an institution rural women might have little knowledge about or little concern even about. As hard-working rural women have no formal employment, their life realities are not reflected by labour statistics either. So useful as this indicator of the GII might be for compar comparisons between nation-states, it hardly captures the differences between different local settings and ethnic cultures within rural Ethiopia. Our research goes beyond such indicators from above. We try to find out what rural women want to achieve in life. Put more generally and not only concerning women, development is about improving people's lives and to define the direction of progress towards improved lives, we first have to lay the aims of goal, aims and goals of the people concerned. Let me now address some methodological issues about how to find out about these aims in life. So how do we find out, out about our female interlocutors' aims in life? To ask them directly, what is your aim in life, might cause embarrassment rather than yield, yield, yielding good answers. As a method to find out about what gives sense and a purpose to the life of a woman, we have given priority to a softer method, the biographical interview. I recommend to start with a woman of some standing to whom the researcher has a good relationship. She should be in the second half of her life, and for our, for, although for our re research younger women, including some in marginal positions, and even young girls are just as, as important, but to start with them might make more senior people feel to have been bypassed. There are other reasons to start with mature or even elderly women. 
They might have more to say, a deeper time depth, a richer experience. Elder women's account might also comprise the perspective of younger women, namely their own former selves, or at least their present views about their former selves. One can then later compare that with what young women have to say today. A biographical interview would typically start with year and place of birth and some remarks about the parents and the social background, and then you'll continue with early childhood memories. The order of presentation is simply chronological. When the narrator stops, one does not need to pose a question, but simply encourages the interlocutor to continue by saying, hmm, or, and then, and next. If one continues like this until one reaches the present time, one necessarily touches all important junctions in life, education, job, migration, marriage, with its stages and possibly its end, and so on. And the choice of topics and the space given to each topic follow the criteria of relevance of the woman who talks about her life, not the categories of the questionnaire or the preconceptions of the interviewer. Whether a given turn in life was good or bad, and what would have been regarded as a success, invariably shines through such accounts. To illustrate this shining through, one example from Desalet's research site in Highland Gamo may suffice. In our conversations with Desalet's neighbor, here she is on this picture, some aspects of what was regarded as good life become clear. She narrated in fluent Amharic, the official language and the school language, not the local one, that she had gone to school for 10 years and then did not have enough points to continue to college. Although her account was purely factual and unemotional, a measure of disappointment sh clearly shone through. So instead of going to college, she became a construction worker in Addis Ababa. But she said that that phase of her life was better than her present life as a, uh, as a farm wife. So as carrying stones and cement on a construction site seem to be physically more demanding than most chores on a farm, the reasons for this preference may relate to life after working hours and urban amenities like ele electricity. To capture these elements of quality of life, we have to go beyond agriculture and household economics and to take social life and other circumstances of life into account. Many men in this village, including the husband of the woman on the picture, are in Addis Ababa as weavers. Whom are women left with uh, uh, domestic chores in addition to running the farm, seeing in the course of a day? Maybe they suffer not only from toil but also from boredom. We mentioned electricity. Other forms of infrastructure are also important. The internet and smartphones would facilitate communication of these women in patrilocal societies with their families of origin who mostly live at quite some distance away and to numerous migrants and cities in the region or in Addis Ababa. It would also provide information about the wider world and it would provide entertainment. Infrastructure, of course, also comprises roads and bridges. We urbanites like, take even hard and dry surfaces to walk and to drive on for granted. For this alleged neighbor, they might have been among the miracles of Addis Ababa. Emmebet has prepared a short film about the course of a day in the life of a Gamma woman. It shows how much moving about is required and how arduous these elements, these movements are. Let us now have a look at this film and then come back to the ideas of Gamma uh, women about a better life. So now it's the film by Emmebet. Thank you, Professor. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is the unfinished short uh, film. The film is done in the uh, southern region of Ethiopia, in Gamozon and Kachasu uh, district. This film shows the daily work of a woman who is living in Arbi village. The name uh, of a woman in this film is Muge. She is the mother of five children. 
Muke starts her daily work early in the morning by cleaning her home and homestead. House wastes like ash, cattle dung, and plants leaves are used to prepare homemade local composts. As you can see, she is you know, preparing uh, the compost by using these products. After that, she moved to her garden to do some cultivation and collect potato for household consumption. Then she changed her clothes and leave her home uh, to do some work in their uh, other farm, you know. Muke and her husband are working on her, on her husband's uh, father farm to get uh, a share from their product, you know, farm product. The place is located in a very far place. Muke is expected to walk three hours to reach the farm and another three hours to return home. She is going to the farm three to four times a week. As you can see, there is no infrastructure in the area. Motorbike is uh, the only means for transportation, but uh, the, the, the place is not even suitable for the motorbike. So people are, you know, walking for hours to reach their farmland or their field. As you can see, she is expected to climb in a very uh, steepy places, and there is a lot of cliffs. These are some collected uh, harvests and on our way to uh, Muke's uh, Illo's farm. And as you can see, people are, you know, collecting their harvests here and there. Uh, 
this is bashkala is uh, a type of crop uh, with the family of you know wheat she is now almost reached to her illos homestead After, you know, she's uh, greeting the families in the, in, uh, in the home, uh, she is quickly changed her working clothes and start collecting local composters, which she was, you know, uh, already prepared by her. Uh, women have, you know, this is uh, preparing compost uh, is... Uh, a woman task in our research site. Women have, uh, you know, preparing the compost in their homestead and carrying it to the farmland. For women, for Mukeskes, as you can see, she is expected to walk hours and hours to reach the farm. So she used, uh, she preferred to uh, prepare the compost in the field rather, you know, taking, in, taking it or carrying it uh, all these miles, you know. Now she's, you know, uh, adding the, the, the compost to the for potato plant, as you can see. After that, she went to the Bashkala farm. Uh, as I have said, it's a crop type with the family of wheat. I liked uh, to the most of Ethiopian region, we found here that it's a woman's task or job to collect harvest. After she collected the harvest, she will take a few from the previous uh, stored harvest. She will take to her home to use it for home consumptions. Yeah. <laughs> 
As you can see, she is taking the same path to her house, but this time with more load on her back. I think you can uh, easily see how you know this uh, climbing this cliff is very hard for women specifically you know for Muge you can see how she is heavily breathed you know climbing this cliff now she's uh, reached her home after a long walk after she reached home she is uh, you know giving the waste products of the crop what she was brought to the cattle as a food she spent the whole day in the in the field so she is now preparing uh, she needs to prepare food for the homestead, for the ham, I mean for the family. Uh, but before that, she is expected to, you know, uh, crush it and let her uh, grind it uh, to make it flour out of it, which would be, you know, used to used later as a family meal, uh, combining with uh, boiled potato. As you can see, there is no facilities or machines or any other, any other means uh, that would you know, help a woman in terms of this problem. Women are still using stone grinding tools uh, to make food uh, in the city area. So they would suffer a lot, you know, after a long day, they need to use, uh, to do this, you know, to make food for children or for the home or the family. This is a gabula, which would be made from, you know, bashkala uh, flour and uh, boiled potato. So thank you, Emma Bit, for this film presentation. I think it has shown how, what makes some of the life of, in, uh, for, especially for women in Gamo, quite arduous in ways we normally don't think about. At Wengalawit's site, her, her host told us that she had never gone to school, but that all her children had. And one of them is at college now studying accounting. To let her children go to school meant that she had to take over work which would otherwise would have been, been done by them. Rural versus urban living conditions seemed to be important considerations. She wanted her children to go to qualify for life in town. And in line with a livelihood approach in a broader sense, we should not focus exclusively on agricultural production and products. Other aspects of life may be just as relevant for understanding the hopes and aims of the women we study. 
For this re method, it is recommended to let the narrative account flow and to interrupt it as little as possible, as I have already explained. In the unlikely case that the evaluation of events as good or bad does not become clear, one can later ask questions like, what was the most fortunate or unfortunate turn in your life? Later in the interview, or coming back to it after listening to the sound recording, summarizing it and transcribing the most illustrative parts, which one might wish to quote, one can still ask more specific questions one has abstained of asking in order not to interrupt the flow of the autobiographic narrative. All specific questions can be asked at a later time. To resume a dialect after an interruption often works surprisingly well. When interlocutors are skeptical or hesitant during the first conversation, one should not push too hard, simply to think and to take one's leave and to come back some other time often helps a great deal. Let me now address the topic of male and female crops. One often finds a rough distinction of crops which are planted in the garden and those planted in the fields. This dichotomy roughly reflects that between those cultivated with the hoe and those cultivated with the plough, and those primarily serving the purpose of subsistence or household consumption versus cash crops. The former element in each of these binaries tends to be associated with women, and the latter with men. So the garden, the hoe, and subsistence is the male, dom the, the female domain. An example for the, for which illustrates of a, of a female crop is the woman inset cow triangle. Inset or enset, also called false banana, is an important subsistence crop in the southern highlands of Ethiopia. And these southern highlands and our sample of regions are represented by Sidama and Gamo. Inset is planted in the immediate vicinity of the house where one also finds the stable of one or two milch cows and their calves, if these calves are not sold when, while they are very young. The inset plants require constant manuring and the compost used for this purpose mostly consists of cow dung, although the dung of the horse, the mule or donkey, if the household has one of these equines, and kitchen or fall also finds its way into the compost. Inset stems are used for the production of different varieties of staple food. They are harvested, prepared, fermented and ultimately cooked by women, while the banana-like long leaves are chopped into palatable pieces and fed to the cow. Everything which has to do with the inset and the dairy cattle kept at the homestead, often just one cow, is the responsibility of the woman. Thus, there's a constant exchange of substances between inset plants and the cow, mediated by the energy of the woman. There's also flow of substance from both the cow and the inset to humans, the members of the household, and if, and if there is a surplus to the market. These flows too are caused and directed by the woman who does the milking and marketing of milk and the preparation of inset-based food like kochu. The triangular flow of energy and substances between inset woman and cow describes much of this production system, but not all of it. The triangle is open to input from outside. Grass is also cut for the cow and straw from the fields tilled primarily by the husband. One woman reports, uh, uh, one woman we visited with Vengelavid also rep uh, reports that she bought pellets or dairy cubes for her cow. Proceeds from the sale of milk and inset products belong to the woman. As our research progresses, we will learn more about the level of separation between the budgets of husband and wife and to which extent the household is, as some definitions have it, an income sharing unit. But there is this notion of income of the wife and it would be interesting to know whether monetary inputs into the described triangle like the purchase of the dairy cube are also covered exclusively by the wife. On these consistence, uh, subsistence-oriented crops, or crops which belong to the sphere of subsistence and are the domain of, of women, we find an encroachment of cash crops. Coffee, for example, 
has been an important cash crop in Sidama for a long time. It is typically grown by smallholders who sell it in a rather monopsonic arrangement to a large parastatal organization. Another such cash crop is Chat, Kat in Somali, Kata edulis with its Latin or scientific name. Its leaves, and of some varieties the bark, of it are chewed as a mild stimulant, as the common explanation has it, although the psychosocial and economic effects of its consumption can be quite severe. So it's debatable how mild the stimulant actually is. These are valuable crops which are grown close to the homesteads adjacent to the inset plants and the vegetable gardens. With the expansion of coffee on chat groves on limited land, male cash crops intrude into the space of female subsistence crops. This comes at the expense of food security for a variety of reasons. One is possible fluctuations of the market prices of these products, another one the fact that men often make inadequate, inadequate provisions for their families. Male income is often spent on feasting and male company and on race standards of clothing. The often quite distinct male and female social spheres in African societies, already pointed out by Evans Pritchard in the 1950s, but not much studied since, need to be explored in this context. How are the ambitions and the performance of people shaped by the fact that they largely live in own gender company and act in front of own gender audiences? What are the bridges between these spheres? How does this combine with the general observation that the genders gender each other, that masculinity largely depends and uh, develops in response to female expectations and vice versa? Does the status of a woman in a female group reflect on her standing with men and vice versa? How about the different aspects of manhood? Is there a role conflict between being a good provider, an attractive mate and a good chum? The questions raised by this perspective are myriad. Apart from competition for the same garden land, there's another way in which inset and chat interact. Inset leaves, like banana leaves in other places, are used to wrap the bundles of chat twigs. Chat dealers provide a market for them. Cutting some of the leaves slows down the growth of the inset trunk, the main source of food. So in this picture now we see inset leaves on their way to the market. The leaves on this donkey cart will no longer help the plants to grow and their sale reduces food production. Selling inset leaves for packaging not only reduces the production of human food, it also deprives the cow of an important part of her diet. It may provide instant cash at the expense of long-term food security. This is not just a, co a conflict between genders. Poor people, including women, might be forced to sell inset leaves to the point of damaging the plant beyond the recovery and destroying the base of the woman inset cow triangle. Another expanding cash crop possibly affecting the power balance between the genders is wheat. Like other grains, wheat is a typical government crop, storable, standardizable and taxable. The war in Ukraine has, increased, has greatly increased its market value. Later in this presentation, Tirsit, who is speaking about West Gotcham, will address this topic. Let me now come to kinship networks and split land rights. In a biographical interview, and as I explained, this is our methodological starting point, in such a biographical interview, relatives will be mentioned, like brothers and sisters, and, at the latest at the time of marriage, in-laws, or a final relatives, as they are called in anthropology. This can be taken as an entry point, entry point to a more systematic record of kin relations. When kin relations are recorded for our purpose, it is essential always to record full sibling sets. When you ask about the first ascending generation or the parental generation of your interlocutor, to ask about all his father's siblings or all the siblings of her husband's father in the case of the woman and their, and their descendants reveals how many patrilineal uncles and first cousins he has who might be farmers in the neighborhood and there might be farmers in the immediate neighborhood, 
because they all inherited a share of their father's land. Other brothers and sisters might have gone to town and taken up other jobs, but might still have claims on the land tilled by those who have remained on, uh, have remained on the farms and have remained farmers. For such people, uh, for, uh, for such for household economics and farm management, it might be important to identify such people by placing them in the diagram and recording their names and approximate years of birth. Later, all kinds of questions about the relationship to them can be asked. If land rights are shared with them, they might demand payment in money or in kind, or if the farm is in some need or in some crisis, they might contribute to maintaining a farm in times of stress. If they live in town, they might also be bridgeheads for later migration by others. These examples show how important the recording of networks is for our research questions. Rather than having large samples of numerous individuals who fill out a questionnaire, as would be typical for quantitative research, we study many people plus interconnections between them. At the death of a man, his land is divided among his heirs in equal proportions. In patrilineal inheritance, only men inherit. But this rule is no longer universally followed, and female land ownership and its consequences are a topic of growing importance. Among our researchers, a young woman whose father is not a farmer told me that he has transferred his land rights to his daughters, who now have a claim in the land of some of their father's patrilineal relatives, in accordance with modern law, but in violation of the patrilineal mode of inheritance cre prescribed by tradition. A woman, of course, also has a patrilineage and patrilineal relatives, and therefore there can be patrilineal transmission to a woman, but if the good is then passed on to her children, as would be the case with land, there will be a uterine link as anthropologists have it, or linked through a woman which interrupts the patrilineal chain. Another of our researchers, whose father is not a farmer either, told me that her father owns land which is tilled by others, and that this land will be inherited by brothers, by her brothers only. So even among modern educated urban Ethiopians we find different ways in which such issues are handled. Equal inheritance splits property into smaller and smaller units and the, innovation, and the innovation of letting not only sons but also daughters inherit land, laudable as it is in terms of gender justice, only accelerates this process. Do holdings and claims in land tilled by relatives just become smaller and smaller until they become insignificant and people forget about them or is there some mechanism of consolidation? At the time of uh, drafting this presentation, this question still awaits clar clarification. Let me now come by way of conclusion to a more general uh, dimension of our problem. Human rights comprising equal rights for women and cultural pluralism are both part of the discourse of policy makers, activists, and all those with the post-colonial or decolonial agenda. Human rights are universal values, sadly not empirically, but on the normative level. No one would claim that they universally exist, but we all want, want them to be universally applied, so they are universal on the normative level. Others deny them this universal quality and denounce them as particular, namely Western. It's part of Western values, which we reject. Often this goes hand in hand with the exaltation of collectives, authoritarianism, and the proclamation of alternative forms of democracy. In the community of development agents and policymakers, and broad sections of the public and liberal democracy, both gender equity and cultural rights have a positive ring. Contradictions between them are brushed over. What if the representatives of local cultures, typically men of advanced age, deny women the right to hold property or to participate in the political arena? In Ethiopia, both gender equity and cultural rights have a constitutional rank. 
women have the same rights as men and ethnic groups or in the diction of the Ethiopian constitution, nations, nationalities and peoples are assumed to have contiguous territories in which they have special rights. So now, what if a daughter insists on inheriting a piece of land and then with equal insistence marries a man from another ethnic group? with the consequence that the land in the next generation will be inherited by children who, according to patrilineal descent reckoning, are ethnic others. No amount of eulogy on universal rights and cultural rights in the same breath can conceal the fact that there can be contradictions between the two and there may be hard choices to be made. And my personal plea in this contradiction of values is that, that one should not play out state power against tradition and, and uh, expose women to sort of isolation within their communities by helping them uh, to, to, to uh, realize their, their rights and claim, make their claims against the will of the community. It would be much more productive to, let, to take traditional law along and my experience of 40 years of research in Africa shows that traditional law does change. It's not as immutable as it seemed to be. There is a process of legislation going on. Even people who claim that their, their law is divine, that it's made by God, in fact do change it with the growth of, of population and the growth of clans, they change marriage rules and, and so on. And then they pray for God so that God accepts these changes. And then the, again the idea of, of, of the divine law and the necessities of practical life are reconciled with each other. So it would be our efforts should go into the debates uh, with the people in charge of traditional law to make traditional societies change and to reconcile sort of uh, modern forms of land use and modern forms of, of gender entitlement uh, with local authorities because these local authorities often sort of are the glue of society. We have, uh, they are moral authorities also and we have got enough disruption and violence in the country not to uh, not, not to be very wary of further processes of social disintegration. So this would be my plea. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my today's presentation is on a paradox of uh, waste production, specifically uh, on um, Amhara regional states. So this is a part of our Women in Agriculture project. So me and my colleague Johannes are working on with production in Amhara regional state, particularly in West Gojam zone. So today I will present about the paradox of wheat production. So uh, this Amhara regional state is one of the 11 regional states in Ethiopia. So the region has currently developed 2014 uh, 240,000 hectares for wheat, if barley end has a potential of developing 1.2 uh, million hectares. So uh, it has developed 41,000 hectares for wheat production with a plan of developing 80,000 hectares. So when target is achieved, it's expected to cultivate up to 2 million quintals of wheat, according to the Office of uh, Prime Minister. So um, the study area, when we see the study area, it's a West Gojam zone. It's one of the prominent place of TEF cultivation, not f for wheat production. That means the zone is uh, famous in uh, TEF cultivation. So it is one of the most water resourceful area of the country. Uh, Joke Mountain, which is one of the, the water source in Northern Highland is found in this particular zone and uh, it's also a source of Blue Nile, particularly Sakala is found in this zone. It has two big rivers such as Kog and Watatabba and five tributaries. So uh, just um, when I come to the methodology, as I have said, this is uh, an intensive field work and ethnographic work. 
which is a, a part of a big project in women in agriculture. So methodologically, we have been using a qualitative method of data collection. So uh, currently, we, our focus uh, is on two waradas such as uh, North Mecha Warada and Sakala Warada. So uh, participant observation, focus group discussion, group interviews, key informant interviews and informal conversations are uh, used to collect the data. Uh, so far we have conducted six focus group discussions, uh, three with men and three with women. So we are incorporating the voice of the men just to see also you know their perspective regarding the role of women in agriculture we are also interviewing uh, different stakeholders from both governmental and non-governmental sectors so but uh, we are uh, our focus is using this uh, feminist research methodology particularly feminist intersectionality so uh, just to say something about the role of women in agriculture, women headed households participate in all sorts of agricultural activities uh, in uh, Amhara regional states. Uh, it's obvious in also other parts of the country. However, most of the time, women opt to be involved in vegetable and fruit production, particularly these women headed uh, households are up to participate in uh, cash crop production uh, uh, so uh, uh, even though millet and maize are the most important crops in the area uh, while as i have said women uh, produce uh, avocado mango potato tomato onion and other vegetables and fruits uh, using the uh, irrigation canal as well as some water uh, sources uh, in addition to the regular rainfall. So women are the major producers of vegetable in uh, the area, we can say. So uh, when, uh, just to give an impression about the role of uh, women in agricultural activities, as I have said, uh, agriculture in Northern Ethiopia is predominantly a main activity because women are no more, uh, not uh, highly engaged in plow uh, cultivation. So that's why men are predominantly participate in such activities. Uh, whereas women have also their own role in market and other uh, domestic activities. Uh, the problem is, you know, uh, here we have two segments of women. We have women headed households and we have also married women. So when we see women headed households, so they uh, mostly engage in uh, uh, crop um, um, fruit and vegetable production because of two reasons first of all since they don't involve it in uh, this uh, plow uh, cultivation so uh, if they want to involve in plow cultivation they have to rent their land to the main farmer so uh, they are not comfortable to use uh, to provide their um, plots to the farmers because of different reasons. The first reason is uh, the farmers may not uh, provide the return of the agricultural products as they are expected. Second, uh, the farmers may deceive the amount of money that they get from uh, selling the crops and that's why women uh, try to involved in other uh, agricultural activities but however as we know uh, currently uh, the government of ethiopia put uh, a direction of uh, wheat production largely uh, as we uh, uh, around the country so uh, here women are facing different challenges uh, so uh, the first challenge related to wheat production is uh, First, the availability of wheat seed is limited. The Ethiopian seed enterprise and regional seed co uh, companies don't produce as much as uh, demanded by the farmers. So women also complained about the nepotism that exclude women from the system. Second, seed quality is variable, so uh, they are not getting the right uh, quality seed even though if they are interested to produce uh, this wheat. Finally, farmers, especially women, have cash constraint because of lack of uh, these uh, loan organizations and cooperatives. So because of this and different reasons, women are highly facing the challenges 
of this wheat production of course a challenge uh, uh, men have also facing the same challenge but women have uh, facing double challenge because of uh, you know the rolling over uh, challenges that has been uh, there for uh, a long period of time uh, of course this research is work in progress best but uh, uh, from the data that uh, we have at hand we can just suggest some recommendations the first recommendation is you know producing gender sensitive policy is very vital because uh, we can uh, when we see uh, the policy especially agricultural poli policy and particularly this uh, with production if we can consider it uh, as a policy or a strategy so it's a uh, gender blind and it, it doesn't provide a uh, gender disaggregated uh, prospects and challenges regarding this wheat production uh, second inclusive dialogue from grassroots level and participatory planning is very important because from our data our uh, field stay we can understand that uh, there, there was uh, women were not included uh, in the co consultative dialogue, and you know they were not get a chance to present their causes, and they they may not get uh, a chance of you know uh, pre preferring their own uh, way of uh, how they have to involve in the agricultural activities. And consideration of gender role and gender norm is also important because. Uh, as I have said, women, uh, particularly in our study area, women are not that much uh, participate in plow farming. So when we say that uh, they have to produce wheat, so uh, we are just doing against uh, culture and again against the norm. So uh, this by itself may exclude women from the system. So we have to consider gender role and gender norm when we uh, uh, put such kind of uh, direction. And finally, empowering women with land tenure for sustainable land management is also important. Uh, so these are uh, uh, recommendations for uh, from uh, this field work. But as I have said, since this is work in progress, so uh, the recommendation can be enhanced. And finally, uh, they, they might be used as a policy input. So uh, thank you for listening and this is all about the presentation. Uh, I'm going to present a literature uh, review on women in agriculture. Uh, the, re the review is uh, being done by uh, Dr. Ainalem uh, Magarsa and myself. Uh, the outline of my presentation uh, is the following. Uh, first, I will say a few things about the objectives uh, and research questions of, of the review. And then uh, I will also uh, say a couple of things about the methods and the background. But I will focus on the fourth point, uh, which uh, reviews uh, the major gender disparities in women in agriculture in Ethiopia, and also uh, the underlying factors uh, for the disparities. And then finally, uh, I will uh, present gaps and recommendations for future research. Uh, the, the, this uh, review is, is just a work in progress. Uh, we are at the early stage of uh, the review. Uh, so, uh, as to the objectives, uh, we have two major objectives. The first one is to give a clear picture of the state of knowledge of women in agriculture in Ethiopia. And the second objective is to propose a compelling research agenda. We have also uh, research questions, but in the interest of time, I will not uh, read the uh, questions. Uh, as to the methods that, that we are using, uh, we, we uh, review uh, published case studies and review works uh, since 2010 and uh, research reports, journal article, articles and workshop proceedings and also uh, relevant policy uh, documents uh, are being reviewed. Our method of analysis is mainly th thematic analysis and also uh, content analysis. Uh, as we know, uh, uh, gender dimension is very crucial for economic reasons uh, and also it's a human rights issue and a better understanding of the role of gender would increase uh, productivity 
reduce poverty and improve uh, food security. Uh, in Ethiopia, women make essential contributions to the agricultural uh, sector, but their uh, contributions uh, are not largely, they are largely unrecognized. Uh, there are very many uh, good uh, initiatives, uh, especially in, in the area of policies and strategies. Uh, Ethiopia has ratified uh, many international and regional uh, legal frameworks uh, and also have uh, policies, local policies. Uh, in our literature review, we will try to review uh, uh, these policies. Uh, just to mention two uh, major uh, policies and uh, strategies. One is the Federal Rural Land Administration Proclamation, which grants women equal rights to uh, acquire and inherit, administer and transfer land. And also we have uh, the Gender Equality Strategy for the Agricultural Sector, uh, which is a very highly gender-sensitive uh, strategy. Uh, but the implementation of these uh, uh, strategies and policies is another, another issue. Uh, when we look at the major areas of gender disparities, our uh, literature review so far shows that uh, women have low uh, agricultural productivity, uh, they have uh, you know, limited access to assets, uh, these assets are of course human, social, social uh, physical, natural and financial uh, assets. Uh, if we take land for example, uh, women, um, you know, there is this common understanding that uh, land is a uh, men's domain and also when you look at uh, access to credit uh, women have limited access to credit uh, they have limited access to financial uh, services another uh, point is that you know women have limited access to ex extension services uh, agricultural extension services of course provide information about new technologies, uh, farm, uh, farming knowledge and management practices, but women have little access to these services. Uh, and uh, in relation to market and information, market information is primarily available to men, and because of this, women have little uh, uh, or limited information on risks, hazards, and uh, legal rights. And uh, if we take, for example, uh, value chain activities, women have limited participation in higher level uh, value chain activities. Another uh, issue uh, we have observed in our uh, literature review so far is that women, ha women, have, uh, women are um, highly engaged in uh, household uh, activities. Uh, they have excessive work burdens. And because of that, they, they have this time poverty, uh, which negatively affects their access to resources and information. For example, women uh, don't have time to participate in community forums and uh, trainings, uh, compared uh, to men, of course. And uh, another uh, issue observed in, in, in our uh, review so far is that women have limited influence over decision-making uh, in households and also in uh, formal and informal institutions. For example, in Kabali administrations, uh, most of the leadership positions are filled by men in cooperatives uh, and also community-based organizations. Uh, women have lower representation uh, both in relation to membership and uh, leadership. Uh, another uh, issue has to do with vulnerability and risks because women face, um, because of their uh, position in society, women face numerous obstacles to access uh, productive inputs, assets and services, and these obstacles heighten their vulnerability to food insecurity. And also women have less access to information on risks and hazards. Uh, in our review, we have tried to look also at uh, the structural factors that uh, are the reasons for uh, gender inequalities in, in the agriculture sector. Uh, one has to do with the limited capacity of the government uh, or government sectors uh, in terms of you know, trained human resource, budget and institutional setup uh, to effectively implement policies and strategies. As I said earlier, we have very many good policies and strategies, but uh, implementing these strategies is a challenge. 
and also weak links among the government sector offices and uh, is also observed uh, and also inadequate collaboration among partners uh, for example you know for sharing best practices and in exchanging information and resources as we know it's very important that we share uh, best practices and also share information but there is uh, uh, inadequacy in, in, in doing that. Of course, uh, patriarchy is another uh, challenge. There are very many uh, discriminatory social norms and uh, exclusionary practices in Ethiopia. Uh, these are related to, of course, ownership uh, rights and entitlements, for example, of land. Uh, as we know, um, entitlement of land is in favor of men than women and also uh, gender patterns in uh, division of labor and also control over agricultural products. Uh, there is this taboo against women uh, plowing and sowing and this restricts women's uh, uh, access uh, to uh, resources and also uh, limits their engagement in specific agri agricultural tasks. Mainly uh, female heads of households are affected by, by this uh, disparity. Another uh, issue uh, observed in our uh, literature review so far is the women's agency. There are some studies who try to look at uh, women's agency in, in, in the field of agriculture. Uh, for example, some women, <coughs> women challenge customary laws and practices. Uh, they claim some space in public settings. Uh, for example, they take uh, their cases to court uh, when it comes to uh, problems related to uh, land ownership. Uh, they try to speak out and engage in counter-dominant uh, uh, discourses, but these efforts are highly limited uh, because of various reasons. For example, because of women's lack of knowledge of their entitlements, they are, uh, you know, they uh, undervalue uh, their involvement in uh, uh, and contributions to farming, and they also have low self-esteem. This is because of socialization and uh, discriminatory, discriminatory uh, norms and limited life skills and there is also a lack of collective action we know that you know collective action is, is highly uh, important uh, especially you know women should organize and, uh, and, and you know assert and uh, fight for their rights but because of lack of collective action uh, you know uh, they don't really uh, address uh, issues related to their rights uh, so, uh, we come to the final uh, section where we uh, try to uh, show gaps and also recommend uh, research uh, agenda uh, for future research. Uh, some of this uh, uh, agenda, some of these issues are of course addressed in, in the major research uh, led by Professor Shile. Uh, one point we observed in our literature uh, or one gap that we observed is that uh, most of the research ignore <coughs> women's uh, specific needs. Um, <coughs> this is because there is this uh, assumption that uh, farming is, uh, you know, uh, men are farmers or women are not, are not farmers. So because of this assumption, uh, women's specific needs are not addressed, for example, uh, by uh, extension services because of this false, false assumption that both men and women farmers have similar interests, priorities and development needs, and women's interests are ignored. Another uh, gap observed in our review is uh, the issue of assuming uh, that women are homogeneous, or that women don't, they are, they are putting them in one, in one box, or, uh, but women are different, they have different interests, different needs. Uh, so looking at uh, contextuality, uh, is, is very important. You know, addressing the specific needs of different categories of women is highly important. There are married women, there are female heads of household, there are female youth, and, and also there are pastoral women. So the specific needs of these different uh, groups should be uh, you know, addressed. Another issue uh, has to do with uh, focusing on uh, resource access of women, uh, or providing them with some access and also uh, quantification of women's participation in activities, for example, in the training activities. Uh, but giving less attention or uh, less uh, focus on addressing the systemic issues that create gender inequality. 
you know, it's, it's, it's good to give training for, for women, but we also need to address uh, this, the structural issues, uh, cultural norms and practices, uh, you know, to, to really solve uh, the challenges that women, women face in the uh, research, uh, in our research, uh, led by uh, Professor Schiele, these issues are addressed, you know, it's not only about uh, you know, resources and uh, training and all that, but really looking at uh, the culture, uh, religion, and all these aspects, you know, affecting women's lives. And also the, the, the need to uh, address uh, or to give attention to indigenous knowledge of women. But in our know, research uh, works we have reviewed so far show that uh, indigenous knowledge of women is not well documented uh, or shared. So, uh, you know, our research, uh, I'm sure, would fill that gap because, you know, the researchers would stay in the field for a longer period of time and really, you know, uh, obtain or really uh, document uh, indigenous knowledge of women in the, in the four uh, sites, research sites. Uh, and also, uh, another gap that we have observed is, has to do with, of course, women's agency. There is a, it's very important to give attention to women's uh, power, women's energy, their resilience, their coping mechanisms, because, you know, uh, women challenge uh, customs and they engage in uh, counter-dominant discourses, but this has to be really, you know, documented uh, well. For example, women have best practices in relation to forest management and livestock health. So these best practices have to be uh, you know, documented. And research also should really uh, analyze these this practices. And also recognition of potentials. Uh, women have uh, potentials, like they participate in different uh, organizations, they have different social networks, they, have, they are involved in uh, productive uh, networks, for example, if we take the informal uh, networks, editors, and if we also look at the uh, productive networks and groups, there is this double, and there are different uh, forms of organizations and associations. So this uh, have to be studied because you know this is where women really actively uh, participate, uh, also uh, in addressing their, their challenges. The last point has to do with intersectionality. That is, you know, the need to address the multi-dimensional forms of exclusion and inequality. As we know, uh, gender is just one, one form of identity. There are different forms of identity, uh, ethnicity, class, religion, marital status, you know, disability, you know, all these forms of uh, identity intersect with gender. So to address uh, gender uh, issues, we need to look at the intersection of all these identities. So intersectionality is, is uh, highly important. So research should uh, address uh, the issue of intersectionality.